Um, I can guarantee it will be entertaining. I've heard Rob speak before, but just let me tell you a little bit about Rob's sake. Uh, Rob uh, is a, a professional agrologist and certified agricultural consultant <clears throat> and founded a company some years ago called AgriTrend, which became, I think, one of the most successful companies in Canada, um, advising um, producers right across Canada um, on agricultural practice, both for absolute efficiency of yield, but also thinking about long-term sustainability, soil quality. Many of the things that we've, we've talked about at a research level at uh, this conference. So uh, Rob is really a person that has been very deep into this kind of um, uh, application of our science for many, many years. Um, he is uh, n now uh, the uh, Global Business Development uh, Director of, uh, of Trimble Navigation, because Trimble has taken over AgriTrend quite recently. Um, he's been awarded numerous awards throughout the years. He got the 2014 Canadian uh, um, uh, um, Agro uh, um, Marketer of the Year Award and also in 2006, the uh, distinguished agrologist uh, in Alberta and agro uh, agricultural entrepreneur. Now, uh, one of the things that we all know him for is, in Western Canada is putting together an amazing movie of which we've seen many shots, but not the whole movie combined yet, called No GMO, K-N-O-W, GMO. And it is one of the best expositions of why biotechnology crops are good for the consumer, good for the producer, and in fact, good for the developing world as well. Um, as I was talking to him earlier on, I just discovered that he's also now uh, purchased land in Uganda, and he's actually farming in Uganda as well. So he is actually not only a farmer here, but a farmer in the developing world too. I think you're really gonna enjoy Rob's presentation. And uh, I've uh, enjoyed not only talking with him, but hearing uh, two talks like this that he's given uh, uh, in the past year and a half. And uh, I think uh, all of the uh, folks in Saskatoon who've heard him know that he's, uh, he's going to both inspire you and entertain you. Rob Say. <clears throat> Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I feel at this point in time vastly underqualified to be in front of such an auspicious group of scientists. Uh, Tim, and the, 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 the topics I heard today and the words that were used, I can't even say them, let alone spell them, but it gives a, uh, a person in agriculture immense confidence to know that we're surrounded by scientists like you from all over the planet that have one thing in mind, and that's making the human condition better. So, I want to congratulate the team for putting on the conference, and I'm going to get right into it. We're going to have some fun tonight, but the topic is serious, and the topic I've chosen tonight is, will agriculture lose significant science to non-science? And yes, you could substitute the word nonsense there, because really a lot of it is the one and the same. So, I began my career as a farm kid. Uh, in 1997, as mentioned, I struck out with a Chevette car a $35,000 credit card and a soil probe. And of the $35,000 credit card, I spent $9,500 on a projector, and I began a company called AgriTrend that grew and grew, and grew to be about uh, 225 or so uh, passionate individuals that are concentrating on making a difference at farm level. We're really about agricultural technology transfer is what we've mostly done. Um, we get involved in all sorts of things from uh, coaching, farmers to uh, providing knowledge. We have 30 PhDs and about, tw uh, I think, 50 masters and data management. So we surround the farmer really with agricultural coaching to help them grow the crop, sell the crop, manage the money, uh, provide research, training, and insight development, which is leading towards algorithm development. And our data system provides connectivity, analytics, and sustainability tracking. Um, AgriData has been utilized by uh, people such as Simplot, to track the production of potatoes, now Cavendish, and we've just done a pilot project with McCain's. So we've been tracking the, the uh, metrics or the, uh, the parameters that go into the production of potatoes from McDonald's French fries now 
for about six years, so I know a little bit about uh, sustainability and data tracking. And as mentioned, in November, we were acquired by the Trimble group of companies, and uh, that was really a great fit because Trimble is uh, equipment agnostic. They uh, aren't involved in the sale of uh, uh, inputs, uh, seed fertilizer, chemical, and neither are we, and we never have been. And so this is really my world and, and what I've done. My world really is one of uh, sitting in planes and uh, spending time on the ground. So from 35,000 feet down to, you know, 3.5 centimeters. And my job right now is really to extend AgriTrend globally and AgriData globally to bring back technology and talent to Trimble and also to educate people about agriculture, which I'm absolutely passionate about. My uh, connection to the soil began really early as a picture I think my mom took of me back in the farm at Innisfree, Alberta, which is just up the road to Highway 16. And, uh, you know, just uh, watering. I think she was just trying to keep me busy. But um, I've been involved in all sorts of aspects of agriculture, from farming, crop protection products, to micronutrients. I spent a lot of time with the Stoller Company working with zinc and manganese and uh, iron and boron and those things, copper. Sulfur industry for a long time, spent some time in the Middle East in the sulfur industry. Uh, been an entrepreneur, I started two retail fertilizer businesses, fertilizer distribution, marketing company, started Agritrend. I'm involved in purebred cattle, uh, international agricultural exposure from Kazakhstan and then down to Australia, New Zealand and South America. Investments in technology and most recently I'm proud of being involved in a farming operation in Uganda. So that's kind of me. Let me just take you a little bit uh, before we get into some of the technology stuff. I want to take you down to some basic stuff. Not too long ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time in uh, Nigeria. So we flew into Abuja, and from Abuja, we went into a plane, and we went to inland to a place called Basita. And I took some soil samples in Basita. One of the things that strikes me when I work with uh, people, and I have had the pleasure of working in Kenya and Uganda. I spent some time in, uh, like I said, in, in Nigeria is as you get on the ground with people, you really learn uh, the opportunities that exist for us to, to quickly transfer technology. I mean, in Kenya, I, was, I remember I was in a hot air balloon taking a picture of hippos in a, in a, in a, uh, in a stream, and I had 3G connectivity, and uh, I was tweeting that picture around the world from a hot air balloon with 3G connectivity in the middle of Kenya, and my cell phone won't work outside of Winnipeg, Canada, because the two... <laughs> Things don't talk. So there, there's a way to leapfrog. There's, a, there's an opportunity here for us to use what we've learned here so that the people in the developing nations don't have to go through 30, 50 years of hardship. One of the things that breaks my heart right now about Kenya is in my visits and subsequent visits to Kenya, I see more one-way diskers being used. And I understand that we have to prepare soil for seedbed preparation, but God, could we do it in a better way that's not degrading the soil? So. My talk will be around a lot of technology stuff, but really, you know, we get back to the debate last night that Rex Murphy was, was moderating, and, uh, and I, I think it was Jim from, was it Jim from uh, Australia? And, and he was talking about the basics, you know, and the basics really are important, and soil fertility is so important. This is a sample of soil from Basita in Nigeria, and, you know, uh, this field is low in pH, it's, it's organic matter is low-ish, uh, probably low on the low side for us, but probably okay for Africa. The uh, CEC is low. There's no nitrogen in the soil. And if you did put nitrogen in the soil, it's going to leach because there's no cation exchange capacity. Uh, phosphate's not bad, and the first thing most people would think about adding is phosphorus when actually that's not the problem. Potassium is low, especially at depth. But, uh, boron is non-existent. There's no boron in the soil. Uh, chloride, copper, and zinc are very, very low. And so you've got people and farmers there that want to buy seed and they want to buy fertilizer. They don't even know the pH of the soil. That's up to us. We have to teach that leadership. And so inventorying the soil and providing good basic leadership is really important. So as I see it in our mantra, at our, our mission statement at AgriTrend has always been to help farmers allocate scarce resources to produce a safe, reliable, and profitable food supply in an environmentally sustainable manner. And I think that goes for everybody in the room. That really is it. Scarce resources, whether it's water or money or fertilizer or time, uh, to produce a safe, reliable, and profitable food supply in an environmentally sustainable manner. 
As I get into my talk, I want to really take you to the big picture, and I have some great people that I follow quite closely. Peter Diamandis is the founder of the XPRIZE Foundation and the author of the book Abundance. He's one of the most creative people on the planet today, I think, and really a good connector. And another one is Ray Kurzweil, and I've had the pleasure of sitting down with Ray several times and being in his courses at uh, Singularity University uh, uh, in Mountain View, California. And Ray Kurzweil, if you guys are musicians, the Kurzweil Music Synthesizer, that's Ray. Uh, optical character recognition, flatbed scanners, that's Ray. He's now the director of engineering at Google. And recently in a conference when he was asked, when are we going to wipe out um, disease on the planet, he, he figured 2033 was the year that it was going to be. And so you want to live that long. Well, you laugh, but really with the exponential rise of technology and genomics and everything that we're facing here, a lot of that is absolutely possible. And so you don't want to die too quick, okay? So if you're at that age, you've got to keep yourself healthy for the next number of years so you can get inside. So one of the things that often crosses my path is I run into a whole bunch of people who say, I wish we lived in the good old days. I wish we lived in the good old days. Well, this was the good old days. I was born in 1960 in Canada. We are the belt of the baby boomers. There's more of me. I'm 56 than anybody else in Canada. And, and at the age, in 1960, this represented the number of people who died under the age of 50. The red dot is, uh, is uh, China. The blue big dot is India. These are the people who lived above the age of 70. You flash forward to 2015. These are the people who are dying under the age of 50. These are the people who are living over the age of 70, and notice they've had to extend the access to 85 years because we're all living longer. So are we dying of cancer? More probably, but we're not dying of infection. So it's a really interesting take on life. So quick, for the millennials in the room, all two of you, I want you to make a choice right now. I want you to choose, do you want to live in this life? Do you want to live in this world? Or do you want to live in this world? I choose this world. This world is a way better world to live in. The problem is, most of us are floating down a river drinking beer, not thinking. And there's nothing wrong with floating down a river drinking a beer on a hot summer day. The problem is that most people don't think about what's pulling them along. There are powerful currents that are pulling each and every, was, every one of us in this room along. These powerful technology currents. Now, when you're in a floating down a river drinking beer, the only way that you know how fast you're going really is to look at the shoreline. And there's only four reactions if you go, holy shit, we're really going fast down the river here. There's only four reactions. One is to sw jump out of the tube and swim against the current. Second reaction is to try to get scared and you swim towards the shoreline where all the turbulence is. Third reaction is, oh shit, we're really moving fast down the river. Just keep on drinking beer. Most people do that, not even aware of the currents. The last choice is to jump out of the tube and swim in the direction that the river is flowing. And this room is full of people who understand the current, the currents that are facing agriculture. So what is it that's driving our society today? We live today in an exponential world. And that's different than 1960. This exponentiality that we experience is vastly different than your parents or when you were growing up. The difference between a linear world and exponential world is you get up, have a cup of coffee and walk out of your porch down your driveway and take 30 steps. You turn around, you've gone 30 paces. Today we live in an exponential world where the first step is one step, second step is two steps, third step is four steps. And by the time you've taken 30 exponential steps, you've taken a billion yards, a billion steps, and circled the planet 26,000 times. 30 exponential steps. That's the world we live in. Data. It's estimated from the dawn of civilization to 2003, man produced about five exabytes of data. How much is that? Shitload. Lots of data. I don't know. <laughs> it's lots of data. The point is, we produce... Five exabytes of data now every two weeks, and some say every 15 minutes. Back on the farm when I was growing up, ideas had sex. I had an idea to 
tweak the combine. I'd invite a neighbor over. We'd do a little bit of welding, some bashing, adjust some of the things on the combine, try to figure out, the sw you know, just stuff. Today's I ideas have origins. You have an idea. It could be manufactured in China and marketed in Europe in the same week. It's just absolutely fantastic, the world we live in. These are the currents. Why do they exist? They all exist for one reason, computing power. Today, a computer calculates at about 10 to the 11th uh, calculations per second. Uh, by 2023, a computer will be calculating at 20, 10 to the 16th power. Why is that significant? It's the same speed as a human brain. A little slower for us Ukrainians, but still pretty <laughs> fast. A $1,000 laptop calculating the same speed as a human brain by 2050, and we've talked a lot about 2050, a $1,000 laptop will calculate as fast as the entire human population on the planet. And we don't want things to change? Think about that. Think about the currents. Think about the data. And we don't want things to change. A lot of this has to do with our attitude, our mindset. What is your mindset? Is your mindset Malthusian, that the earth is running out of resources and we can't fix it? Is that what you really believe, that the pie is defined and you can't make more pie? Is that what you believe? Or are you a cornucopian that believes in abundance? We'll figure it out. We always have. We'll figure it out and figure it out better. It has a lot to do with how you look at life and where you get your information from. The media is full of Malthusians. Most of social media is full of Malthusians. It's hard to find cornucopians. So, the question. Will agriculture lose significant science to non-science? And this is a really big question. And one that society is floating down a river, drinking beer, just saying, oh, well, I don't care one way or the other. Don't even pay any attention to it. Can't even say the word chromosome. <laughs> Problem is people have a romanticized view of agriculture that doesn't exist anymore. It's not 1960 anymore. You take a red barn and a farmer with a straw hat and bib overalls in a in a, in a fendered, an open fendered cab truck, 1950 style, and you have the quintessential urban view of agriculture. It's not true. There's a need to technology. Things were happening back then that wasn't so good, and today things are different. The guy holding the phone is Terry Aberhart, good friend of mine. Terry farms 11,000 acres with his family, northeastern Saskatchewan, Manitoba border area. I asked him to come a meeting a couple years ago, it was September right in the middle of his harvest, and he came to a meeting. At the end of the evening, we're on the lake. We're on Sylvan Lake at the end of the evening, drinking beer. He's there in the middle of harvest watching his wife combine on his iPhone. And you don't tell me the world's getting better. It's a good world. She's a better combine operator than he is anyways. So people don't understand that we can do this stuff. They don't understand it. So I wrote a book. You guys all received it. It's called The Agriculture Manifesto. It ended up being an Amazon 2014 best of books. And I know the letters are big, and there's not really any pictures in it. So Mark, sorry about that. But anyways, it's, 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 it's just some ideas of where I think agriculture is going. And it's a cornucopian book, except the first area is about the non-science movement. And that concerns me. And we have to begin shouting out of the darkness. So why am I in front of you tonight? It all started at a Chilliwack concert. <laughs> Chilliwack is a band, Canadian band. They got some great tunes. And I was giving several speeches that week in Winnipeg and Brandon. Came back to Red Deer, gave a speech on Saturday at our local agricultural exposition. And the president of uh, Red Deer College was there. He said, what are you doing tonight, Rob? I said, I'm kind of tired, but I don't know. He said, I got tickets for, I got a ticket for Chilliwack. You want to come? And I said, I love Chilliwack. He gave me this VIP ticket to Chilliwack, and that was great. I, and I have to confess, I had a couple glasses of wine. It was the end of a week, and I went to the Chilliwack concert, and I pulled up my shirt, and I relaxed, and I loosened up everything, and got in my seat. I was the last row, and there's 650 people in the auditorium in Red Deer. The lights went down, and I was tweeting that I was at the Chilliwack concert, and I love Chilliwack's music. California girl, California girl. You know, it's just great. I'm just tweeting away about 
A third of the way through the concert, the guy with the guitar stops the concert, said the next song is about the patenting of life, about the blowing, uh, the poison blowing in the wind. It's, it's about people controlling things. And I sat up and I went, what the hell is this about? And then he goes, yeah, this next song is about an organic farmer named Percy Schmeisner in Saskatchewan just trying to grow organic canola. And, of course, Monsanto sued him. And, and, it, you know, and, it just, and they're, they're so powerful. Well, of course they won. And I shut it out of the darkness. You're wrong. And I stopped the rock concert. <laughs> and he goes, what? And I said, well, I know the facts of this case and what you're telling the audience is wrong. He says, I have the mic. I said, doesn't mean you're right. We got into it right there in the middle of the conference. <laughs> Lasted about a minute or so, and I left, and I was freaking shaking and stuff like that. And then I, wrote, I got home, and I wrote letters of apology to the president of the Red Deer College and the mayor of the city of Red Deer and the mayor of the county of Red Deer and the MLA, who's a farmer, and the MP, who's a farmer, going, whoa. But as soon as I left the room, people were clapping, but my phone lit up with farmers that were in the audience, and the farmers, and I think some of them made me in the room, said, thanks for standing up for us, Rob. Thanks for sticking up for agriculture. And the next day, I, I wrote a letter to the editor, and I said, there was a commotion last night at the Chilliwack concert. I, I know, because I caused it. <laughs> and I said, this is why, and the letter kind of went viral, and that began what I'm doing today. It really began around an issue of GMO. And the issue is no GMO or no GMO. Do you know it or just is it no? This slide just as easily could be no wheat or no wheat. This slide could be no seed treatment, no seed treatment. This slide could be no dairy, no dairy. This slide could be no anything in agriculture, no fertilizer, no pesticide. It could be anything because people are just viscerally opposed to what we're doing in agriculture. And I said, do you know GMO? Do you understand? Or is it just no? We have to start shouting out of the darkness. Well, I started that whole thing, and I've been on lots of stages, and I got a lot of buddies who can't believe what I'm doing. They kind of think that, you know, like I'm a gladiator or something like that. They, <laughs> not many people coming out to help me, I'll tell you that. It's like just put a, put a you know, kick him into the middle of the dust and let's see if Rob stands up. But it's been kind of fun kind of fun and I'm in a good spot because I'm an independent business guy. I don't sell fertilizer, chemical, or seed. I understand agriculture intuitively. I don't belong to the government. I can say what I want to say. I got lots to say. I believe that the non-science movement is the greatest threat to global food security today. I believe that agriculture is the glue that holds civilization together. You want anarchy? Take away food from people. I believe the non-science movement is the greatest threat to global food security today. We have all kinds of evidence of science and agriculture. We have replicated studies and metadata studies and all kinds of studies, and it's all trumped by, I just know. What do you know? I read it on the interweb. <laughs> well, who's driving the seat today in this discussion? Dr. Kevin Folta is a professor from the University of Florida who's absolutely been crucified because of his stand for genetic engineering. He's been FOIA'd, Free of Inf Freedom of Information Act, by U.S. Right to Know, who found out that the University of Florida accepted $25,000 from Monsanto to do meetings to educate students about genetic engineering. He was on the front page of the New York Times as being called a fraud. He's still being FOIA'd. Food Babe made two requests for him to go back three years in time to pull up all of his emails and give them to her. What the frick's going on here? Gwyneth Paltrow gets a chance to, to, to talk in front of Congress about GMOs. What does Gwyneth Paltrow know about science? And somehow, there's a journalistic equivalence here between these two? And you got all these trends going on. You got detox and paleo and all these experts that are just out there pushing these diets and supplements and stuff like that. Food Babe says 90% of all canola oil is genetically engineered. Get it out of your pantry along with all of your canola oil and your corn oil and everything else. You get it out of your pantry and buy my coconut oil. 
And somehow that's okay. This is Jason Lusk's where 82% of Americans when surveyed said that GMO should be labeled. In the same survey, 80% said food containing DNA should be labeled. Well, it's funny shit, but I mean, like this is, this is what we're dealing with. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. They did a survey, Jason did a survey about Americans concerned about health food issues, and the number one issue was salmonella. Fair, num- fair enough, that, that, that's really, a, that's, that's trouble. E. coli is trouble. Number third, in terms of what keeps Americans awake at night about food safety is GMO, and number four is hormones, and number five is swine flu. Swine flu is behind GMO, and if you get swine flu, you're gonna be sick like for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Like, bad. But somehow in the American public, in, in, in our elitist North American way, we think the GMO is somehow more dangerous for us than swine flu or mad cow or you got it all there. It's the whole panacea of freakinoid stuff going on there. So Food Babe says, here's my guide for choosing the best butter so you can avoid GMO and partial. I, I said, Food Babe, what butters are GMO? How do I know? And she goes, well, just avoid Monsanto butter. <laughs> well, this is funny, except she's got 100,000 followers who retweet that to 100,000 or a million followers. It's all funny, except that she's been, you know, voted one of the most influential food people in America. It's all funny, except the policies that result from this fear-based campaign. So I did a TEDx talk. This picture was taken in Lodwar, Kenya one of the poorest areas I've ever visited. This woman is clutching the two most precious things to her are her children and her technology, her cell phone. And, uh, you know, there's very few people that would be so cruel as to walk up and take the cell phone out of her hand, to rip that cell phone out of her hand. And yet we have all sorts of people wanting to rip the technology out of agriculture's hands and take it away. I get get asked often, can agriculture feed 9 billion people? I said, wrong question! Question is, will we be allowed to feed 9 billion people? That's the right question. Because at the rate it's going right now, you keep stripping away tools from us, forcing us to go back to more tillage, forcing us to use more pesticides and more fertilizer. We're not moving in the right direction, people. And it's all based on policies, based on fear and paranoia. I want to meet some people through my travels. The guy on the, holding the cassava plant on the far left is a guy named Robert from Gulu, Uganda. The guy in the middle kind of there is, uh, Sa- uh, is Eric. He's from Kirichu, Kenya. Samuel is the guy there next to the girl, and he's a banana grower near Uganda. And, of course, the famous picture from online of a girl who's a beautiful girl who's blind. They all have something in common. They all could be helped with technology that exists today or is in development today is being withheld from them. Well, what is it? Well, it's all GM technology, genetically engineered technology is kind of related to them. A lot of controversy around golden rice, but at the end of the day, I have all kinds of people saying, well, these people should just eat a different diet. Well, if they eat rice, it's what they eat. The sooner we can get golden rice into the diet, the better, I say. Brown streak virus in cassava decimates the cassava crop, turning it useless. People still try to feed it to their children. Their children get sick. There's a bacterial wilt and black cigatoga attacking the banana crop. There is no cure. Samuel's cutting down his bananas. They're importing bananas to areas of Uganda where they should be growing bananas. In Kenya right now, a lot of the corn is being rendered useless with mycotoxin and aflatoxin through lethal necrosis and maize. There are no cures. One of the cool things that we're working on right now, you folks are working on, is genetic engineering solutions. But you go, you know what? This isn't my problem. I don't know those people. I don't know the crops. I really don't care. Well, do you care about orange juice? Because if you care about orange juice, drink it. Because this year's Florida orange crop is 20% less than the year before, all being attacked by psyllis flies that are rendering the orchards useless because of citrus greening. How bad is it? It's this bad. This is from one of our dealers, uh, done some work with aerial imagery. 
The blue areas are dead trees, purples are the dying trees, the red is what's left of the orchard. There is, no, there is no citrus industry left in Florida in a few years, and now they found it in California, and there is no cure. You can spray all you want with insecticides, you can't knock these buggers back. They are killing the trees. There is no cure. Genetic engineering is one of the hopes that we have. We're going to need engineer, genetic engineering uh, to help maintain global food security. It is one of the tools in our toolbox. The problem is people are spinning it to fear-based pan- paranoia, and fanaticism is causing global suffering. Straight off Greenpeace's site, it, genetic engineering could be a threat to human and health, and donate here. The Economist magazine said the number of children under the age of five who died from malnutrition in 2013 was 3.1 million children under the age of five who died of malnutrition. The number of people who died from GMO is zero ever. I'm not saying that genetic engineering can solve all the problems, but it could help. It's a tool that's being withheld from some of the poorest people on the planet. And it seems the less we spend on food, the more time we have to complain about food. In America right now, in North America, we spend less than 10% of our disposable income on food, while in Kenya, they spend about 45%. In Nigeria, it's about 50% of disposable income on food. When you're hungry and your family's hungry, you need technology, you need to have food. Here, all we do is decide what kind of wrapper we want to buy our food in. This is food paranoia at its best, and it's a first world problem. If you go to Google right now and you type in GMO into Google Images, this is what you get. I don't know what's wrong with all of these fruits, vegetables, and plants. Most of them aren't genetically engineered, but surely all of them are diabetic. (laughs) Because if that's how you think that genetic engineers do their breeding, you need to give your head a shake. But maybe they are diabetic, because if you know somebody who injects insulin into themselves right now, Humalog and Novalin are GM technologies. They're genetically engineered to reduce side effects. So anybody who takes injections of of insulin is being kept alive with GMO technology. Yet there's people out there protesting against GMOs. No GMO, no GMO. Maybe they're protesting hemophiliacs. Because if you're a hemophiliac, you're also being kept alive with GMO technology. No GMO. They're teaching their children to be anti-GMO. Maybe they're protesting cheese. No GMO. 90% of North America's cheese is GMO'd because chismosin, rennet, is, used to be scraped out of the lining of calf stomachs to act as a coagulant for cheese. Today it's GMO'd. No GMO. He's teaching their kids to protest a company called Monsanto. Chances are they couldn't spell it. Monsanto. Monsanto's a big corporation. 2015 revenues are right around $15 billion. They speak positively about GM technology to their customers, which are farmers, about 1% of the population. Whole Foods now is bigger than Monsanto. Whole Foods speaks negatively about GMO technology to their customers, the other 99%. Whole Foods has about 4.6, close to 5 million followers on Twitter, and Monsanto has an astounding 70,000 followers. I get accused of being a shill, and I'm saying, who is shilling for who here? Really think about this. What's the difference between these peppers? This is a grocery store in Arizona. The difference between these two peppers is 30 feet and $250,000. Because the peppers on the right are 65% more money than the peppers on the left. If you feed a family of four, by the time the kids get out of high school, you'll have spent a quarter million dollars on groceries and the peppers on the left. My research easily says that the differential is 30 to 300 percent, and because you can afford to pay 30 to 300 percent more to support your food philosophy, it gives you the right to condemn those who can't? Apparently it does. November 12, 2014, the fashion air heiress Vivian Westwood, the millionaire fashion heiress, presented a petition to the British Parliament saying that British Parliament should ban GMOs. On her way out, she was asked by reporters, what are poor people supposed to do who can't afford organic food? She said they should eat less. The voices of science are being drowned out by the voices of fear and paranoia. 
First world activism and elitism is hurting the poorest people on the planet. It's hurting the Roberts, the Samuels, the Eric's, the half a million kids that go blind from vitamin A deficiency every year and die the subsequent year, about half of them. We're going to need all science, including GMO, if we're going to feed 9 billion people, and we should celebrate agricultural success. We should celebrate organic farming. There is a lot we can learn from organic farming. There's a lot they're doing that's pretty cool. Cover crops, rotational crops, management of soil microorganisms, all good things that we can learn from. We should support local farmers and buy food locally where we can and get to know those farmers. And I would buy local food anytime. I don't care if it's, uh, if it's conventional or GMO or organic. I want to meet that farmer. Better yet, grow your own food. For all of those North Americans who are so high and mighty, go and grow your own food. You'll appreciate fungicides very quickly. We should celebrate fertilizer. We heard today the Haber-Bosch process. <sighs> Take in a breath. 78% nitrogen. It's estimated that 50 to now 80% of the protein in every single human being on the planet owes itself to Haber-Bosch. <sighs> every breath you take, every move you make. Haber-Bosch. Right? Pesticides, we should celebrate pesticides. Well, why should we? If you took pesticides away from the world farmers tomorrow, very short order, yields around the planet would drop by 42% and people would start to starve. Yes, we should celebrate pesticides. Do we want to use more of them? Nope. Are they better? Way better than when I was growing up on the farm. We used to sell stuff, Dave Dizziak said the audience, we used to sell pounds on ground. Today it's grams per acre on ground. We should celebrate genetic engineering. We should absolutely celebrate it and embrace it for the science and the wonderful advancements that it is. And here's a question. Could the future of food be GMO? Could it be genetically modified organic food production? Because the organic movement began with a reduction wanting to reduce the utilization of synthetic fertilizers and certainly to reduce the utilization of synthetic pesticides. If there's a farmer in the room here, put up your hand if you want to buy more fertilizer or spend more money on crop protection. Put up your hand. People in the city have a strange view of farmers. They think we jump out of bed in June and want to jump in that sprayer and spend another $20 an acre. That's just strange. The organic, or the organic movement began to re, with the philosophy of trying to get back to more traditional crop rotations, reduce chemical fertilizers, reduce synthetic pesticides. The only technology that I know of on the horizon that could do this is genetic engineering. The only technology that I know of that could allow us to farm more organically is genetic engineering. So why did the organic movement become the anti-GMO movement? Why did that happen? It happened because of big money. Big money. And marketing. And marketing fear. And spinning paranoia into an ignorant consumer base. It began because when you market organic powdered sugar, that molecular structure is sugar, it's sugar. You can sell your organic water. <laughs> you can sell your Himalayan non-GMO rock salt. It's, uh, it's frickin' salt, mind other Himalayans. <laughs> you can sell your organic, non-GMO, corn-free, gluten-free cosmetics. Because when I kiss my girlfriend, I don't want no gluten on no lips. <laughs> frickin' retarded. Label spin, GMO, natural, organic. I took this picture at Whole Foods in New York City. These chips are organic, gluten-free, non-GMO, kosher, non-fried, 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 and vegan, and they're only $7.99 for three ounces. I don't know what the hell's in them, but there's a lot to eat in them, and I don't think you could live very long on them. 
Make no mistake, for those of you who are listening to me live and those of you who are listening on the internet, go and Google the academic review on the organic marketing report. They estimate at that time, I think it was about a 2012 report, that over $2.5 billion was being circulated annually in the U.S. through over 300 disparate organizations to perpetuate fear because without fear, you cannot command higher prices. Look at this academic review. Read it. I'm not making this up. I'm not against organic farmers. It's just what's going on in the marketing. And today we heard that over $10 billion is, spending, is being spent annually on global generation of fear. And only $8.5 billion is being spent on research work in agriculture. The consumer is educated. She's smart. She's intelligent and ignorant. She wants to buy organic to avoid the chemicals. Well, back to uh, Kenya for a second. These are chrysanthemums. You know what they use to harvest from chrysanthemums? They use the harvest to make pyrethrum. Pyrethrum is an organic pesticide. Pyrethrum, pyrethroid is synthetic, right? Well, no, there's no organic pesticides. Well, of course there is. There's pyrethrum right there. Any one of these green things is an organic pesticide. There's glyphosate. That's Roundup, and there's Bacillus thuringiensis. That's an organic insecticide that they spray on organic crops to knock back the Lapidoptera. There are those of you who drank too much last night. Alcohol is just slightly safer toxicology-wise than Roundup. <laughs> Got up in the morning, went outside for a smoke, had a coffee, came back inside, popped an aspirin, and put a bunch of salt on your eggs, all of that is more toxic than Roundup. People say that there's no pesticides used in organic production. This, just the other day from the internet, all this chemical for 310 acres of organic tomatoes tonight is going to be a long night. That is a combination of crop protection products and fertilizer products, but don't tell me we're not spraying stuff on, at, on organic crops, because we are. Just because you put a sign up at the end of this the crop and say it's organic, bugs stay away, doesn't mean they do. <laughs> the consumer says, I don't want to buy organic because it's not, because it's, uh, I buy organic because it's not genetically modified, it's natural. Well, all food has been genetically modified. Everything over time has been engineered to our purpose. You think these bulldogs and all these dogs they got are natural? <laughs> really? You know? So I have a couple challenges for you. The first one is to stop using the term GMO. When somebody says GMO, just put up your hand and say, are you really talking about genetic engineering? And they go, what's the difference? Well, you say, really, all crops have been genetically modified. Are you talking about engineered crops? And they say, what's the difference? I say, well, the difference is, would you rather drive on a modified bridge or an engineered bridge? <laughs> Good question. There's a difference. See, genetic engineering is nothing more than an advancement of the breeding process. All crops have been genetically modified, whether it's open pollination, hybridization, mutagenesis, which is, you know, absolutely asinine that you can subject seeds to gamma nuclear radiation or subjection to carcinogenic chemicals, and that's okay with the organic crowd. Cross species, you know, and, and then you got RNAi, you got transgenic, cisgenic, gene editing, and now CRISPR-9 technology, which is really the realm of genetic engineering. And somehow this is bad on the right, and the stuff on the left is somehow okay. You see, because of the currents, plant breeding has advanced more in the last five months than it has in the previous 5,000 years. And somehow we're not supposed to take advantage of that. And people ask about labeling GMOs, I say, what do you want to label? It's, it's not an ingredient. GMO is a breeding process. You're going to start labeling crops because they've been combined with a case or a John Deere combine? Because maybe that's a concern to you. I don't know. We don't label things based on breeding processes. Genetic engineering is an advancement of the breeding process. It's been an impeccable safety record with over 244 scientific organizations, and it's making a tremendous difference around the world. The, you've heard lots of stories about the papaya, but we wouldn't have a papaya industry in Hawaii if it wasn't for Dr. Gonzalez and the people who had saved the papaya with the fighting the ring sprout virus with rainbow papaya, which is a genetically engineered crop. Mark talked about the brinjal. 
uh, situation in Bangladesh and the amount of pesticides the farmers would spray on the crop, often sprayed by women and children, sometimes six times a week, with insecticides, the most harsh things you can spray on. And because of genetic engineering, the BT brinjal is reducing that down by 70 to 90%. It's a tremendous success story. But I heard countries around the world have banned farmers from GMO. Why? I heard that. They banned farmers from going GMO. Well, how much of this is non-tariff trade barrier? Think France and think Scotland. Scotland recently announced their farmers couldn't G grow GMO. It has nothing to do with science. It has to do with Scotland protecting its image. France doesn't want GMO. Their farmers would be slaughtered if we were allowed to export our canola into France because our canola grows way better. They'd have to fight that. How much of this is fear-based? I understand one of, the top one of the top ministers in Kenya came back from a trip from America, was diagnosed with cancer, was told, did you eat corn while you were in America? And convinced that she caught cancer by eating corn. How much of this is two-faced? Over 90% of the European Union's livestock feed is GMO'd, and they won't let their farmers grow it. I've been on the ground in Russia and Ukraine, lots of dirty fields of soybeans, and all of a sudden, really clean fields. I say, what's the difference? They go, magic beans. <laughs> Don't tell me there's not genetically engineered crops over there, because there are. Will the current ag policy in the European Union turn it into the Museum of Farming? That's the question. And were there high and elitist policies in the European Union to hurt the poorest people on the planet? That's a good question. The benefits of genetic engineering crops are amazing. Stuart talked here, some of his stats, 53% reduction in our canola herbicide use, 55% reduction in consumer or producer exposure, Environmental impact is down, yields are up, soil erosion is down 66%, greenhouse gas down 26%. Doesn't that sound to you like a sustainable technology moving in the right direction? In Ontario, we're not, we don't have the latest stats. Uh, one of my guys, uh, Christopher Duvall, is assembling these, but this is the land base devoted to corn. This is the yield of corn in Ontario. This is the total amount of herbicides, including glyphosate, that's used in Ontario to 2008. We're going to wait for the latest numbers. The biggest success story in North America with genetically engineered crops by far is the reduction of insecticide use. This is just one turbofoss, a bad one that's gone down tremendously because of Bacillus thuringiensis. Yes, an organic pesticide that's now spliced into genetically engineered crops so farmers don't have to indiscriminately spray these organophosphates and carbamates on the crop. So if we eliminated Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt cotton, corn, and soybeans, farmers would have to go back to using more insecticides, and those insecticides do kill bees and butterflies and stuff. This doesn't, right? Corn yields. This is the progression of corn yields in the United States. The Last world record, I think, out of Georgia, 503 bushels of corn per acre. This is Europe's more linear and lower line, and this is South America. Uh, Brazil corn yields have increased 400% with only 43% more land. They are screaming forward. So GMO technology in Brazil is not resulting in the destruction of the rainforest. It's saving the rainforest because we're not tilling as much land, and we're not bringing as much land into cultivation. Robert Peretti, just outside of Alta Cruz in in Argentina, this generation of farmers in Argentina is going to leave more soil behind than when they came to this earth. I was with Howard uh, Buffett at the conference there, and he said that Argentina is the envy of the world for its adoption of no-till technology, largely driven by the success of GMO crops and their adoption of that technology to reduce erosion. So will agriculture lose significant science to non-science there are all sorts of people that are betting on the fear-based to sell stuff to the consumer. And uh, I'm going to give you a video here. And uh, I want you to think about the video as you're watching it. And I want you to think about who produced the video.
Genetically engineered crops in agriculture, a worldwide experiment on people, animals, and nature. Cultivation of genetically engineered crops like soy, maize, cotton, or canola have far-reaching consequences. 90% of genetically engineered crops belong to the corporate agricultural group Monsanto. The rest are owned by Syngenta, DuPont, Bayer, and others. Genetic manipulation of crops can have uncontrollable consequences. The function of genomes is only partially understood, but foreign genes are still introduced into crops. These genetically engineered crops are widely cultivated outdoors, where they cannot be controlled. Currently, 90% of GE cultivation occurs in the Americas, particularly in the USA, Argentina, Brazil, and Canada. It seems researchers have forgotten that genetically engineered crops once outside can no longer be controlled like they could in the lab. GE crops can self-replicate and pass on their new characteristics to neighboring crops, penetrating the fields of farmers who want to cultivate their crops without genetic engineering. Adverts from the genetic engineering lobby claim genetically engineered crops produce higher yields, but this marketing mantra is a complete hoax. It has been shown that crop yields for GE crops are no higher than normal crops, but farmers must buy more expensive patented genetically engineered seeds each year. This forces them to become dependent on corporate giants. But that's not all. Genetic engineering giants also produce pesticides and herbicides. There are two characteristic traits of genetically engineered crops. They are either resistant to herbicides, in which case the genetic engineering company itself produces the suitable herbicide, or the genetically engineered crop emits an insecticide. Whether or not the crops are resistant to weed killer or give off poisonous gases, not only weeds or pests are eliminated, other beneficial field growth and some living creatures are killed as well. But nature adapts, so pests and weeds develop resistance to pesticides. And that means that increasing amounts of stronger pesticides will be used. Especially grave consequences are observed in this respect in monocultures. For example, in South America, rainforests and other natural landscapes are destroyed every day to make room for genetically engineered monocultures and pasture. At the same time, the soil and groundwater are poisoned. On top of that, the genetic engineering lobby claims genetically engineered crops can help to reduce world hunger. Genetic engineering is not the answer. There is enough food on Earth. The problem is that it's not distributed fairly. But the fact is that most genetically engineered crops find their way into the livestock chain. So they end up as meat or dairy products in supermarkets. And that's bad. Along with all the destructive effects on the environment, one last awkward question remains. How do genetically engineered crops affect humans and animals? The answer is, no one knows. Therefore, it's important for you to carefully consider which products you buy. Get informed and get involved, because our world is not a testing ground. For more information about genetic engineering, go to greenpeace.org slash GMO. No technology in the face of agriculture has had more testing than genetically engineered crops. It costs what we learned today, $130 million to bring a crop to market today. Someday, maybe you or I will have enough time to sit down and rip apart this, vid this video sentence by sentence for the lies and distortions that it truly is. You see, there's big money in selling fear. Greenpeace's annual 2014 revenues were $210 million US dollars. There's big money in selling fear. So my question is, what are we going to do about it? Maybe the question is, what am I going to do about it? Sit in a mirror and just look in that mirror and say, what am I going to do about it? I got mad one day and I said, somebody's got to change the conversation from no GMO to no GMO. I said, I'm going to make a movie. I've never made a movie before. I know nothing about making a movie. I'm going to make a movie. I'm going to make a documentary. So I called up a filmmaker that I know. This handsome lad, my son, Nick Syke. He's a filmmaker. I said, Nick, you want to make a movie? He goes, what kind of movie, Dad? I said, no GMO. He says, that's strange. I said, K-N-O-W, Nick. He goes, really? I got to work with you? I said, yeah, I think so. 
So we started a movie project. Hi, my name is Rob Syke and I'm a professional agriculturalist who works with farmers. I work with all kinds of farmers. I work with conventional farmers. I work with high-tech farmers. I even work with organic farmers and all kinds of crops from corn to canola to cotton. The project that I'm here to talk to you today about is No GMO, the documentary. It's a project designed to bring attention and information to urbanites and school children about what's really going on in agriculture. GMO technology has been a benefit to people all across the world. What we have here is a crop of canola. This is a GMO crop and this produces one of the most healthy oils on the planet today for human consumption. This crop is grown with the GMO technology that allows farmers to significantly reduce tillage and reduce the amount of pesticide they're using to grow this crop. The fact of the matter is the total pesticide load on the land and in the crop is dramatically lower because of GMO technology. However, this is not what you would see if you Googled or researched uh, GMO technology on the internet. It's my contention that the non-science movement is the largest threat to agriculture today in terms of our ability to feed the planet. Golden rice, which has been ready for commercialization since 2002, that is fortified with beta carotene that can provide vitamin A to prevent millions of people from going blind and has yet been sitting on the shelf while activists fight against its commercialization. This film is designed to attack the memes that attack GMO. And we need your help to raise the funds necessary to take this message forward to film the full documentary, which will be global in nature. Thanks for listening to this, and thanks for participating in No GMO, the movie project. So we started with some buddies of mine kicking in about 80 grand. Uh, I kicked in 10, my company kicked in 10. I made six phone calls. We started, we launched the project. Um, and uh, Nick started to develop the team and the, the script. And I said, so I'm going to be in the movie a lot, right, Nick? He said, no, nah, you're not that. No, you're too harsh. You're uh, too old. Uh, we need to have a softer, more gentle tone. Uh, the movie's not being made for farmers. It's being made for millennials and people young and younger than millennials. This is the tone of the movie, which is going to be very, very inclusive and uh, kind of fun, so here it goes. Is something bad happening when you eat an apple? Because we changed it to taste better. In 1943, Abraham Maslow defined human motivation as a hierarchy of needs, and supporting everything we do is food. We have a long track record of adapting it modifying it to better suit our needs we made carrots orange that doesn't make them wrong broccoli cauliflower brussels sprouts all come from one plant that's not unnatural and with so many people counting on a better solution to hunger isn't every idea worth knowing let's stop shouting start listening find out what it really takes to feed us. All of us. No GMO. An uplifting discussion about food. So do you see the, uh, the helix there and the apples and the integration that we had of the graphics and stuff? It's a, it's a world-class documentary we're making. Full featured, plus vignettes that are available for agriculture in the classroom. Design, the concept is to neutralize, educate, and advocate. We've been working with the Farm and Food Care Foundation of Canada. Um, we've raised all of our money from farmers and farm organizations, and uh, we want to finish it that way, too. The business plan has been executed. We've raised about 900000 We need another half a million dollars to finish the movie. I had it kind of all lined up, and then the liberals defeated the conservative government, and I lost all my contacts, and away went the grant. So... 
it seriously pushed us back by at least six months to early 2017. We've already got 109 hours of footage from Canada, the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Uganda, and Kenya, and we're actively fundraising to complete the movie. We need to buy music right now, do animation, do all the editing and all the graphics that need to be done to pull this thing together. So when it comes out, you'll be proud to know that uh, it, it has been a good project. It's primarily tacking two issues, and those issues aren't what you think. They're not technological issues. The issues really are two issues of confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance, and it's really what we're trying to tackle in the movie because people say no GMO without knowing GMO. We need to attack this, so. One of my favorite books of all time is Abundance, and it's by a couple of guys named Steve Coulter and Peter Diamandis. I was thrilled to get an interview with Peter Diamandis for this movie because he's the founder and CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation. And he's got a lot of awesome thoughts about our scarcity mindset and how we can maybe get over that and incorporate biotechnology into our food supply. Here's a great clip with him. When people say, you know, it's not fair that in the United States and North America, people get to take these long showers and eat as much food as they want and use as much energy. We really need to be fair, which means we have to take our resources on the planet Earth and slice them up equally among all the people on Earth. And that mindset, that scarcity mindset, really pisses me off. Because the fact of the matter is, rather than taking a pie and slicing it up into smaller and smaller pieces, it's time to bake more pies, right? There truly is very little that is scarce on this planet. And when people get that, it's a mind frame, a mind shift change that, you know, energy, as an example, we live on a planet that is bathed in 5,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. So energy is not scarce. It's just not in a fully usable form yet. The same thing is true for water. You know, that pale blue dot that Carl Sagan spoke about when he turned Voyager around, we are on a water planet. Two thirds of our planet is covered with water. Yes, 97.5% is salt, you know, 2% is ice, and we fight over half a percent. But the fact of the matter is we now are developing the technologies for being able to extract water. You know, I live in California, which is experiencing a drought right next to the largest body of water on the planet. Now, it's an issue today, clearly is an issue today. But the fact is that technologies, whether it's graphene and other material sciences or large scale desalination, will give us the ability to provide as much water as we need. And if you have energy and you have water and we have massive computational power, we are gonna be able to feed this planet. Peter's a really connected guy. And uh, he is uh, he's really kind of pretty cool in terms of his thinking. So Nick took his team to Hawaii, and Hawaii really is ground zero in terms of the anti-GMO movement because they have been trying to pass bylaws and state laws outlanding, outlawing, and there was at one time a law in the books, a bylaw in the books, that was going to uh, basically fine farmers and jail them if they were growing GMO crops. This is Nick interviewing Dr. Gonzalez, and I'll just show you what Hawaii... In the middle 80s, when biotechnology was a king, they'd have meetings and say, you know, in 10 years, we're gonna have all these different crops, tomato, blah, 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 all of this thing, commercialized virus resistance. So what happened? Well, that, that's my question. Right now, we're living in a society when you have a huge disconnection between the farming and the general public. Life now is changing, and Maui is the ground zero. We are going through these different phases, and right now in agriculture, in our life, we, we think that anything that is natural, it's supposed to be good for us. It is going to be very difficult to change this trend. So do you feed your kids GMO food? I do, all the time, and on purpose. We're looking at what we're doing today, as a commodity. And the reality is, we're producing food. 
How do we have a discussion and dialogue about producing food? Hundreds of people want to talk to me, but they never listen. That's life, eh? The next video is from Hawaii, and this is a, uh, a contrast between um, one, one uh, philo philo philosophy and maybe somebody who's ground right on the ground. Um, this guy's name is Blue Mountain. It's not his farm. His name is Blue Mountain. And uh, the next guy you're going to see on the screen is a farmer wearing a kamatsu a hat. And uh, the contrast you're going to hear about is, first of all, they're going to be discussing the contrast between the... Um, ring spot virus that decimated the papaya crop in Hawaii. And you're gonna have this guy's perspective and then you're gonna have a farmer's perspective. And they're both farmers, he's an organic farmer. But he came in late, as near as we can tell, he came out of Connecticut or something. So, um, and, the, and, and then they're gonna talk about uh, the diversity of crops. Uh, they're gonna talk about technology adoption. And I, I think this is a pretty cool little clip. So, so not that you would have an argument with a GM farmer in Pune, but if you were looking at it like a GM papaya farmer's operation in, in Hawaii, um, like what, what other choice could, could those producers there have made to avoid the GM? Like if you lose your farm to a virus, I'm just wondering like what, what do you think, what's the solution? Well, I, I'm questioning even the data. From what I understand, uh, it was not this panacea that the genetic, uh, you know, biotech industry wants to make it out to be. I got wiped out. Uh, just, I was cutting trees every week. I had like about seven, eight acres of papaya trees here. Every week I would be cutting down trees. And it was just too much. So I moved on to the North Shore, find new land, virgin land again to escape the disease. Mm -hmm. But within five years, the same, same situation. So a disease was just spreading. The pressure, virus pressure was too much. And so it got to the point where Oahu was just wiped out. And we gave up, just about gave up all the papayas on Oahu. So it's a, it's a whole balance. I, I would rather have some loss to uh, pests than to introduce uh, chemicals and pesticides, fungicides that we don't really know mm. how they accumulate either in the soil here or what they do when they get washed into the streams. And Not, there's, there's nothing certain in the world. You know, I, when I, whenever, whenever I give a talk, I was asking, how many of you have one of these in your hands? You know, everyone goes, this never has been tested. This just came out, what, 10 years ago? How much radio waves is affecting your brains, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was to tell that to young people and say, well, are you going to reject it? No. I mean, this is interesting. I, I just noticed, I, I'm, I'm a movie maker, so I watch mm -hmm. a lot of film, watch a lot of TV, mm -hmm. and uh, I noticed that when it comes to food and telling people about food, the number one device used is fear, it seems like to me. I have really, it's a hard time, it's hard for me to think of a documentary about food that is not based around scaring the people mm -hmm. who are watching it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what do, you, what, do you, what do you make of that? Well, I'd like to see it be more of a celebration of the diversity of plants and medicinal plants and food plants that are available in this world. I mean, we're lucky enough to live in a semi-tropical climate where we can grow pretty much anything. You know, yeah. all of the tropical fruits from South America and so on can be grown here. So we do have that food selection. I, I think it's... Uh, it's a wonder when you go down the vegetable aisle and there's so many different colors and shapes yeah. and textures. Why is very vulnerable. All, 80, 90% of our food comes in from the mainland, you know, or from someplace else. And so we were desperately trying to maintain our local supply. But yet, if you keep nicking away from these guys, who's gonna produce it? Go to the open market, you see a lot of local fruits, a lot of local vegetables, and you cut their legs off, you're not gonna have that. So as we go down the process of making the movie, we want to contrast first world, privileged world, to developing world. So this is off the streets of San Francisco. So as a guy making a film about genetically modified food and organic food and kind of how all of those things interrelate, I think it's really important that I know what consumers are thinking about these topics. So. When we were in San Francisco, we stopped outside of a few different grocery stores and spoke to people about their impressions of organic and GMO and how all of this is presented in the marketplace. 
really, really intriguing answers here, and I'm excited to share them with you. You know, I think the uh, risks of uh, GMO is, you know, just that. It's a risk. It's a no. So, uh, why mess with a good thing? Tell me what, uh, what have you heard of GMO foods? I've, I've heard a lot of g about GMO foods. My, my opinion is a bit varied on it. Okay. Number one is that for people that can afford not to have that food, it's obviously ideal for them to stay organic and buy foods at a higher price that are organically farmed and all of that. Uh, you try to stick to organic, but... Uh, the challenges of uh, sitting around reading the labels and digging through it, that's the harder part. So do you as a consumer feel overburdened by the, the kind of messaging and the advertising around GMO, non-GMO, organic? Of course, I mean advertising. I mean the idea is to obfuscate and confuse and get people to do what you want. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're very lucky in the Bay Area in that we've had, we have a lot of resources here, so you really can buy local, you can buy organic and feel good about that purchases. But if you look outside of a region like California, people don't always have those options. And especially if you look internationally at kids. So here's the question, do you give a starving kid a genetically modified tomato or do you just let them starve? So do you think that an organic label is more of an ideological thing or do you think it's an advertising, uh, an advertising thing? Uh, more ideological, I mean, it, um, the, uh, the goal is there, yeah. uh, but again, you know, I think the uh, advertising world uh, does a really good job of uh, utilizing whatever the popular labeling is. And look, I'd rather have organic food than GMO, if, right. me personally as a consumer. Mm. So if I see something and I think that's organic, I'm probably going to lend myself towards that. Right. And I think you know, that's the kind of shopper that they want to get rather than you know, everybody else that uh, will just shop indiscriminately. Isn't that great that they have a choice of that? Mm. So a consumer choice is always a wonderful thing and they can choose for themselves what they do. Mm. Yes? Yes. So a lot of times it's a price issue as well. So some people can't afford even locally grown corn, for instance, which could be a dollar an ear versus a genetically modified corn, which could be 25 cents an ear. Mm. They have to look at their family and what their purchase power is with that. So this is kind of pretty interesting stuff, you know? And uh, you got to think that uh, genetically modified labeling is going to push more people away from it because they're paranoid about what it says. And so now I'm going to take you down to uh, Africa, and we've had discussions about the banana, and uh, let's have a quick look at what's going on there with respect to Soon bananas. we shall forget the, the banana plants and even cassava plants if we don't adopt the new sciences, mm. modern science. Yeah. So this tree, we're, we're saying, had six months or so to get to the point where it can produce fruit, right? It is nine months to nine produce, months. To, to bring uh, what? That is, uh, to, 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 to produce. Right. To become, to, to show signs of getting a bunch. So the two things that are striking about that from a North American perspective are that, A, a plant can get this big in nine months. You under know? proper management. Yeah, under nine proper months. management. Yes. And then, B, months. Look at the, sh the sheer mass of destruction here, right? This isn't a little plant. This is tons and tons of the plant being destroyed by a bacteria. This is, this is sickness, and this plant needs a, a vaccination, or we need a plant that is resistant to this. This needs a solution. We have the power to do it. The scientists have the power. Yeah. Uh, how much? How much was this tree worth? What, how much value did we lose by cutting this down? Uh, now, when we talk of one bunch, yeah, we are forgetting the suckers. Right. We are forgetting the marching material. There's all this value here that is now just lost. A minimum of two hundred thousand syringes, Uganda syringes, lost. Oh. Oh. Lost. There's the news. Just, just one stay. When it is diseased, the yellowish uh, fluid comes out of this. Right. They, 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 they experience it, they cut right. at this main stream, and then they observe mm. yellowish, and they, that one. They That's no it. good. It's not good. No good. She's asking. Us. She's asking. Mm. We're, we're trying. We're trying to get a solution here. We're trying to tell people who don't know about it so that we can do something about it. 
Um, it, it seemed to me that the people were begging for answers to for the researchers. Oh God. <laughs> you want to be put in an awkward position? Have have somebody at a market ask you for a solution? I don't know if we caught that on or not, but there's a point where a lady came up to us in the market and through Simon, our interpreter, she asked me if I knew of a solution. What am I going to say to that? Yes, but my country is keeping it from you? Awkward. It was, it was an awkward position, and not in a bad way, but just in a way that highlights the real gravity of this situation, right? Is I, I do have a solution. Unfortunately, me wanting to give it to you isn't enough. I need you to want to give it to her. So that's our project. That's what we're working on. Um, some of the latest news on the genetic engineering front. We've had a successful movie built in Saskatchewan called License to Farm that interviews the canola industry, farmers, etc. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to download it. Right now, the Senate is actively working to try to come up with a U.S. labeling uh, compromise or a law because on July 1st, in eight days, the Vermont law goes into effect that says you have to label anything that was in genetically engineered, any produce, any grocery product that has genetically engineered materials moving into the state of Vermont have to be labeled, excluding cheese, which is conveniently excluded because Vermont is a cheese state, so we know that cheese is GMO and that's been excluded. Hypocrisy is its finest. But the Senate is working on this, and if this doesn't happen by July 1st, the state is going to go through massive upheaval as each state tries to come up with its own labeling laws. It's a disaster. On the good side, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on May 17th re released another study showing the positive side of genetic engineered crops, and the Royal Society calls for a European GM review of the ban on genetic engineering. And yet today, a documentary came out showing the perils of Briti Binjal. So this is an uh, animated documentary designed to spin fear about farmers that are using GMO or Bt Brinjal. Right now, the controversy in Europe around glyphosate is swirling. Will they take away one of the most effective and safest weed killers on the planet? I don't know what the farmers end up using there, but it is interesting, and this picture is also interesting. I don't know if I'd be spraying Roundup all over my trees, but anyway. So what does Monsanto have to say about all this? So, is Monsanto the same company it was during the Vietnam War? I thought it would be great to ask this question to the president of Monsanto, Brett Beckerman. Here's the resulting answer. Can you explain to the average consumer who still thinks that Monsanto is the same company they were in the Vietnam War days, how that is not the case? Yeah, we're a vastly different company. And, and in fact, the, uh, we still carry the name. And beyond carrying the name, there's not much similar to our company. Uh, we're totally focused on agriculture today. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we do have crop protection materials that we sell based on chemistry within the, within the agricultural business. Um, but we're not in the plastics and polymers and the pharmaceutical business. And we used to have NutraSweet and those kind of products. We're not in any of those today. Mm -hmm. um, we're totally focused on agriculture and helping farmers increase the productivity of, of agriculture. And oftentimes, a lot of what I read and I, I hear being said about us relates to 40, 50 years ago mm -hmm. as a company. And that was a long time ago. And most of the people around here today uh, weren't even here when those kinds of decisions were being made and, and, um, and the issues were being addressed back then. All right, I'm going to wind up with my presentation by just showing you a little adventure I had two weekends ago. This was in British Columbia. I went for the May long weekend to Kelowna. And I decided that on the May long weekend, I would spend part of it by just kind of participating in the march against the march against Monsanto. So, uh, yeah, so anyways, I, I went down there, took some chloroplast and made a sign, and I got this great T-shirt. And uh, so I decided to go down there and, for shits and giggles, see what would happen. I say, my name is 
So we're here in Kelowna. It's uh, May 21st. Uh, farmers are seeding right now and uh, taking the opportunity to uh, be at the March Against Monsanto while they're on today. So this will be kind of fun. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so there they are. There's the March Against Monsanto. And you see that grass area there, or that little sign. It's about 12 feet away from the March Against Monsanto. I thought that'd be a good place to set up my sign. So I set the signs up there, kind of right opposite the March Against Monsanto. They were not quite prepared for anybody to show up that was actually in favor of genetic engineering. That so it's uh, May 21st, and uh, I just facts. took some we time today because I was in Kelowna and to uh, make up some signs and come on the the down. down to a bunch of people that are talking about Africa genetic engineering. And I thought I would okay. come up and with some fact sheets here and, uh, and, and uh, offer myself as a counterpoint to the march against uh, so, the myths that are out there and just help educate some people. I've had some people come up to me so far and want to talk a little bit, primarily a preach, but not talk. And I'm looking forward to having some dialogue with them today. So... These are the signs you get. Geoengineering, chemtrails poisoning our air, GMOs poisoning our food, fluoride poisoning our body, and vaccines poisoning our bodies. I don't know what geoengineering is, but there's somebody watching it. Um, and uh, it's, it's all just like, it's just strange, you know, like so conspiracy laden in there. And, and the signs are just so whack. I mean, you know, uh, it, you know, a nation that destroys the soil and all the things that we know not to be true, but it's there and the, s the sentiment is angry and, and uh, how do we go from Agent Orange to vegetables and it's just visceral hatred, you know, and, and so uh, I was uh, trying to explain something to this well, I'll just let you watch. Why, Why do you approve of it? I don't think you do. Do you eat organic food? You're telling me. Do you eat organic food? Yes, I do. Then you approve like of mutagenesis. Over 2,500 organic crops owe their origins to either nuclear radiation or subjection to carcinogenic chemicals. You need to. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about ruby red grapefruit that wouldn't exist unless it was nuclear radiation. We can't shut up. Well, if you want to shut up, move away. No. So, do you understand? No, I'm standing right here. Thank you. But do you understand that the organic movement uh, endorses mutagenesis? Do you know that? I'm serious. Do you know that? Can you guys move on? Yeah. Hey, I'm standing right here. Okay, then keep quiet, please. Well, there you have it, folks. This is a fantastic thing. I just want to have a conversation, oh, but this little bee person, person is here just knocking my things down. So, what would That's happen if I went over and knocked down signs? And uh, Wendy Wright is going to touch on this one. Santo is being tried for crimes against humanity in the Hague this October. Yay! 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 So, what I urge you to do is talk to your local grocers and tell them you do not want GMO apples. So, uh, so I, I did, okay, it actually gets better. Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, this is a piece I was doing on the fact that we really want the same things. Organic food and GMOs don't have to be mutually exclusive. The all organic movement organic began with the reduction organic. of synthetic yeah, pesticides memory, right? and a reduction on dependent on fertilizers. So one of the only sciences uh, that's capable of actually doing this so is genetic solid. engineering. So I really it's view the future of food actually as being genetically dependent. modified organic food production. It makes total sense to me when you look at science that that's the way this should go. That's why this, uh, this rally is so off base because so much of what these people want is actually within grasp by utilizing genetic engineering as a science as we do in medicine with diabetics as we do in uh science, as we do in science with hemophiliacs and knowledge please welcome here so good fellas i have a right to this i have a right to this same as anybody else does i'm a canadian bank tax Starting to get a little pissed here. All right.
So at the end of the march, they all go marching off, and their organizer, Darren Howard's left there, and so I go over to him basically to propose a debate. This is what happened. Here, have respect for the speaker and don't interrupt him. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go one better. I'll ask you a favor. So next year... Are you listening or are you just it. waiting for your turn to talk? No, I've heard you. Then I, that's I, all I got to say. But well, why I don't read... What's that? Why don't you for a second? Well, because I'm not here to listen. Oh, of course oh, not. No, of course Do you know why? Because I'm a journalist. Now, if you want to enter into so with a debate with me, I'll set up a venue to do it. But I'm not doing it right now. You know why? Why? Because I'm here to oppose GMOs, and I'm enjoying my day. I'm enjoying my day, too. It's been a okay. great day. Keep but, but, but I, so there it is, a journalist who doesn't want to actually talk about anything that he doesn't want to agree with. All right. Good. All right. So after, this is what started to happen. So I won't debate Rob Syke for the same reason I won't eat out of the toilet. And then it's the truth, as rude as it gets, that Rob came to our march against Monsanto, Rob dropped his speaker, showed his lack of credibility. Um, and I think the other part is pretty good there. Um, I think something about if this is the best that they can do, he's a pretty poor show or something like that. Anyway, um, so what happened, though, after was even better because they started to eat their young. They started to fight amongst themselves online, and eventually he just resigned. He just said, I've had it with you bunch of... And he resigns and leaves the march against Monsanto. So, uh, so why bother? Well, the reason you bother is because there were a bunch of people around the outside edge watching this all unfold. They came up to me afterward. The guy in the green t-shirt and the toque was a very intelligent young man. He said, I want to hear more about this side of the equation. You're one guy, there are a hundred, and yet they seem to be very upset with you. And then the lady is a reporter who came, and then this thing just starts to get better and better. Because when they did uh, the news about the march against Monsanto, the proliferation of GMOs attracts 100 in protests. One sole opponent of the benefits of genetically modified food braid the crowd. There's the article, and all the yellow stuff is me. <laughs> so we actually ended up hijacking the, the press. And after that, uh, I had farms.com and Real Agriculture do a story on me and everything like that. So what's the point as I close? The point is this. Each of us owes it to ourselves and our industry to be educated about this technology and what we're doing. Not speaking up, for each one of you who has not spoken up at the time you should have, perpetuates FUD. You know the movie Food Inc? I think the next movie should be FUD Inc. The people who spin fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's 80% of the people in the middle. We're the science side, terribly quiet, March Against Monsanto is terribly noisy. 80% in the middle is wondering what the hell is the truth, but all they hear is the noisy side and never hear from you. And eventually they must believe that that's true because there's nobody else standing up. Each one of us can stand up, and if we don't advocate for science, we will lose science. And my final message is that you count. Every time you get on Facebook, every time you get on Twitter, and somebody says something that you know to be false, and you say, that's not true, there's a whole bunch of people watching you, like a gladiator, cheering you on. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you so much, Rob, and uh, there might be one or two questions you've provoked. I don't know if anybody does want to, uh, to be controversial and argue back with Rob, uh, but uh, as you can see, as long as you don't knock over his posters, uh, he's, uh, he's quite a civilized guy.
Okay, I'll re repeat the question. The question is, what can you do as scientists to engage in conversation? Should we change the term, like GMO? Absolutely. I think as soon as somebody starts to say GMO online, you should get online as a scientist and say, I'm a scientist, the term GMO is really a nonsense term. Are you referring to genetic engineering? What's the difference, right? Would you rather drive on a modified bridge or an engineered bridge? I think we have the, the chance, the opportunity to change the conversation to be one of sophistication and science and advancement of the process. I think that every time you sit on your hands and watch somebody say something stupid online, you're giving them more strength. So yes, as scientists, you guys are in the prime position to get online and just say, you know, you don't have to call them liars, you don't have to call them you know, names or anything. You just say, that's incorrect. Let me correct you. Well, who are you to correct me? I just happen to be a molecular geneticist. I'd back away. You know? Anybody else? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. You absolutely, when, 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 I'm, when I'm challenging an absolute anti-GMO radical who will never change their mind, I know that I will never change their mind. But through the course of the dialogue, got 7,600 people watching me on Twitter. That's a lot of people kind of watching the interaction go on. You know, that little, I haven't put it on YouTube yet, but I just posted it on Facebook. 40,000 hits of the lady knocking down my signs. People <laughs> love that stuff. It'd only been better if she'd have whacked me. That would have been just better yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question here? Yep. Uh, I'm over here. Okay. Uh, we recently had a workshop on regulation, and All right. we had an American up from the states that was talking about the Trump, <laughs> Bernie Sanders thing, and he said, "You know, one of the mistakes we make is that we think we can neutralize the message by attacking the message. We need to attack the messenger." And I think that was, uh, had a lot of credibility, is that we're spending a lot of time attacking the message, which really hasn't got us much in the last decade or, well, actually two decades. I think it's now we need to start pointing out the, uh, the hypocrisy of the messenger, which is Greenpeace and those kinds of organizations. Well, you know, it, uh, you, you know the list of, of the people out there that are just pounding the drum, making a living off of the fear campaign, whether it's Vadina Shiva or Jeffrey Smith or, you know, this wolf guy or whoever it is. You know, Mercol you know the guys that are spinning the fear, so you just challenge them like I just did. Call them out. Call them out. It's not just arguing with science. You've got to say that those people have uh, an agenda and it's to foster fear. How many supplements do you think Mercola would sell if he wasn't generating the fear he generates? All right. Hello. Good. <laughs> well, I promised you an exciting time with Rob and uh, the fact that so many uh, highly opinionated scientists have stayed riveted in their seats, Rob, is uh, undoubtedly um, a uh, uh, evidence that what you were saying is something that was very thought-provoking. Uh, all of us have got something to say about this, and all of us have got a responsibility to say something about this. Um, we're all called into this debate at some, some time or another, Rationality has to prevail, and I think what we've heard tonight is actually a, uh, um, a, uh, an action to, to demonstrate that rational thought is something that needs to be brought uh, to the eyes of the general public. It is that 80% that we're really talking to. Anyway, join me again in thanking uh, Rob for such an entertaining evening. That brings to an end uh, the, 
fun and games for this evening, but I'm sure there's still more wine on the table and I uh, hope uh, we'll continue to uh, continue these discussions over the next 24 hours. Thank you.